This is going to be talking about how the textile mills and large machine shops were powered and were starting off in 1840 and then moving forward as far as 1920. Power was produced by water wheels originally and crude steam engines. Coal was expensive. Hydropower was readily available, but not that reliable, and we'll see what the Boston Associates did to improve reliability. And by the 1920s, of course, then electric power was readily available. And I took some information from various sources. In particular, the first one, Water Power in Lowell by Patrick Malone. Uh, it's a very useful book. And uh, <clears throat> since Mr. Malone is going to be talking later on, I've got to, you know, in this series, I've got to give him some credit. I've basically taken some of my illustrations from that. Uh, Water Power, a History of Industrial Power is another, you know, classic textbook, and basically that author has taken a bunch of old illustrations from around you know, 1800, 1800, 1850, and then put them in his book. And on steam engines, the classic references, of course, A History of the Growth of the Steam Engine by Robert Henry Thurston, and then some internet research and some standard engineering textbooks which I won't bore you with. Uh, now, how much power did the early mills take? Well, fortunately, the proprietors of the locks and canals in Lowell and their predecessor company sold their hydropower in units called mill power. And one mill power was the amount of water times a fall equal to what it took to run the second of the two early mills in, uh, right here in Waltham. There were two mills. The first one was the one Bob Perry referred to. The second one uh, was built a few years later, and they defined that as their standard for water power. It's about 85 water horsepower, uh, that is flow times fall, and by the time you figure the efficiency of those water wheels, about 55 shaft horsepower. If you were going to build a mill and use a steam engine, you needed fuel. And my research indicates that firewood wasn't as plentiful as uh, you might think, because a lot of the forests had been cleared for uh, agriculture. And of course, the big timbers were being saved for lumber. The primary boiler fuel was coal, and most of it from various parts of Pennsylvania. The first available fuel was anthracite uh, from eastern Pennsylvania, and then later on, uh, bituminous coal from western Pennsylvania around Pittsburgh came into play. Anthracite, of course, is, is hard coal. It's about, let's see, call it 80% carbon, 5% other stuff, and then the rest ash. It tends to have high ash content, which makes it a little difficult to keep the fire clean, but uh, burns very cleanly once you get it going. Uh, by the 1820s, there were several canal companies running more or less along the Schuylkill River in Pens eastern Pennsylvania that went from the coal country around Scranton, uh, Redding, and that area, into Philadelphia. And from there, they were on deep water and could uh, load onto ocean-going ships and get it up the coast. Um, and also, the Delaware and Hudson Canal was built about the same period, and that ran across uh, Penn Central Pennsylvania, uh, across Pennsylvania from the uh, coal fields across New York State, and then ended up the Hudson River around Kingston, where they could load the coal onto ships for ocean transport. But all of this transport from wagons from the coal mines to canal boats, canal boats several days down the canal, and then transshipping again from the canal boats to ships, and then unloading the ships 
at a port city if you had your plant on a port city and could use the coal directly or then carrying the coal from the port up to where your plant was uh, made coal pretty expensive stuff. Uh, bituminous was discovered in western Pennsylvania in the 1700s. Lack of transportation kept it there <clears throat> until about 1852 when the Pennsylvania Railroad came through from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia and they made it over the Allegheny Mountains and got the coal uh, into Philadelphia and on the Delaware River and it could be shipped. Um, and that was, some of that was good steam coal. It had higher volatiles making it a little easier uh, to fire. Um, and it's still, there's still a lot of coal out there in Pennsylvania. I understand that about, oh, 2010, there was a uh, highway project somewhere near Pittsburgh where the contractor actually hit coal in their excavation uh, for the highway cut, and so they brought in a mining company to basically mine it, haul it off, and sell it so they can get back to doing what they understood, which was moving dirt. Uh, getting the coal from a port city to a place like Lowell was difficult. There was a rail, the Boston Lowell Railroad was in service by 1835, but strangely, we didn't get tracks to Waltham until about 1843. And no all rail coal route till the mid to late 1800s. So again, coal was expensive. But if you had coal, you again, if you were on a port like New Bedford, Fall River, where they didn't have a whole lot of hydro, you'd run your mill on a steam engine. And the steam engines they had back then were kind of crude. They had what's called a slide valve arrangement, a very simple valve gear that went back and forth and fed the steam to one cylinder or another alternately. But there were a couple of firms, Fairbanks, Clark and Company in Providence, and we'll hear more about them later. Thurston and Babcock in Providence became Thurston Green and Company, and they were the ones that adopted the sickles cut off for steam engines, and later they became the uh, Providence Steam Engine Company. And then in New York, the Allaire Works, which bought out Robert Fulton's shop uh, and, and starting in 1816, and of course, Oliver Evans in Philadelphia starting in 18. Oh, one, and then his sons-in-law ran it as the Mars Works until 18, about 18, the 1890s. Here's the museum's Erie City steam engine. It's sort of buried back in that corner, uh, but it has, it's a later engine, but it's still a very simple machine. Here's the cylinder and the crosshead on the connecting rod and a very simple valve arrangement, and we've taken the cover off, replaced it with plexiglass so you can see how it works, but it's, it's not a particularly complicated or sophisticated design. What about hydro? Well, hydropower, of course, is site-specific. You gotta have a flow of water, and you gotta have a change in elevation. Uh, usually you've gotta build a dam, uh, uh, to establish that, and then you've got to build canals. And it depends on the stream flow. The bigger the drainage area, the more stream flow and probably the more reliable the water is. And here are the Lowell canals, and this is from Malone's book. Uh, here's the dam, which presumably followed the rock. Here is the original canal, and it divided up in a couple of different canals. And this was a two-level system. Uh, this was a high-level canal and took the full 30-foot fall to the Merrimack Mills. The rest dumped into a lower-level canal and the lower mills and the lower level dumped into um, the, either the Concord River or the Merrimack River. Then in 1848, they built the Northern Canal, 
And when they did that, they changed the flow in this canal here to dump more water here, and they also built a feeder to put water here. Uh, it was a very sophisticated system of uh, canals, dams. Total hydropower Malone estimates just shy of 10,000 at 9,756, although the installed turbines were rated for more. But if you're going to have hydropower, you had to hire a civil engineer or somebody you know, with some experience to lay the whole project out, and you had to hire a big gang of laborers and masons to build it. You also had to hire a good lawyer. Uh, first of all, if you're, the pond behind your dam floods somebody else's land, and the whole purpose of building that pond is to store water, so it probably floods other people's lands. You've got to pay for it. And this is most of the laws are under English common law uh, rather than the uh, specific statutes. If there are several dams on a river, the upstream ones can interfere with the downstream ones. Uh, if a mill shuts for a couple days for inventory and keeps all the water to fill their pond, and nobody downstream gets any water, and there, there are some indications that there were interferences between the dams at Lowell and the water power operations at Lawrence, even though they were controlled by the same, more or less the same people. But here's a particularly egregious case. In 1641, just a few years after Boston was settled, the residents of Dedham <clears throat> were concerned. They didn't have any water power. They had a little stream that had a, I don't know, 40 or 50 foot fall, but it didn't have much water in it. Occasionally, the Charles River would flood and dump water into that stream. So they decided on their own to build a canal or probably a big trench, 4,000 feet, to divert some water from the Charles River into their stream, which later became called the Mother Brook. And that was fine. They, were, they prospered as early as 1767. We didn't even have a country. This was still an English colony. People were starting to, the mill owners in, Charles, in, in Newton and Watertown started protesting about their precious Charles River water as being diverted. It went to court in 1809. It wasn't settled until 1821, 22 years. And some accounts I read indicated as late as the 1890s that people were still bitter about that uh, diversion of water. But that's one indication of how far some of these troubles can go. But if you've got your reliable water supply, then how are you going to convert it into something that'll turn the shaft of your mill? And water wheels were used to convert falling water into uh, power in the US while the French had been doing some work on water turbines that did not uh, reach the US. And the water wheel had to be at least as big as the head or maybe bigger, but it could be built on site so you didn't have to transport a big heavy piece of equipment. You had to transport a lot of logs and maybe some iron work for the metal. And two types of wheels worked on elevation difference, the overshot wheel and the breast wheel. And the overshot is the scenic kind of wheel you see behind old time grist mills and old time sawmills. The water comes in at the very top and then falls and uh, leaves at the bottom. The breast wheel, the water enters somewhat below the top and still falls down. And the breast wheel was favored for mills. They could change the inlet point of the water from a low point with low water elevation to a higher point when they had more water. The big deal was that it discharged the water in the direction of the outflow canal, uh, which meant that if there was a little, what they call backwater, or if the water in the outflow canal was higher than the level of the buckets, a little bit of backwater 
wouldn't affect the breast wheel as much as it affected the overshot wheel. Of course, uh, a lot of backwater would stall either one of those wheels. And again, I'm, this is from Mr. Malone. Here is a breast wheel in Lowell. Typical, the design they use there. It's got a governor. Some had governors, some didn't. And three sets of gates, and he shows them in more detail here. And probably it would be set to open the upper gate first, and then if they needed more water, open the lower two, but you'd like to not waste water by dumping it here when you had the head to go out here. And these buckets, well, you can see them here. They start out radial, and then they come in at an angle. Now, some of the buckets were all the way radial, uh, and the museum's logo shows three wheels with radial buckets. And to keep the water in the buckets, they had what they called a breast. It was, in this country, usually planks fitted very closely to the wheel, so the water stayed in, and the wheel would run in this direction, and so if there was a little bit of backwater, it could work with that. If there was a lot of backwater, well, too bad. Some wheels apparently had a short life, partly because they were orderly wet and dry, and they were in a constantly wet environment, and the stresses on them varied from when the bucket was full and when the bucket was empty, although there are reports that the wheels in Lowell had pretty good life. And once you've got the power from the wheel, now you've got to transmit it to the equipment. And this was the heyday of the line shaft. Originally, and the line shafts transmitted power to the looms, but first you've got to transmit it through the mill. And I cringe every time I, I think about the original system that was developed in England. They had a vertical shaft running the full height of the mill, <clears throat> bevel gears that took the power off at each uh, level to drive line shafts. The problem was that these bevel gears were crude gears as they came from the foundry. Not very precise. Bevel gears have to be precise. Uh, and I've done some research, you can't cut a bevel gear on a milling machine. You can get an approximation and then you've got to clean it up with a file. It requires a fairly sophisticated, what's called a generating machine to generate the gear. And while George Corliss's big engine for the Centennial was not regarded as particularly sophisticated, just scaled up from a previous design, the bevel gears that Corliss built, both to take the power from the machine to the line shafts under the floor, and then to take off the power from the line shafts to drive individual machines, were regarded with amazement because he was one of the first ones to have a good gear cutting machine. But the crude cast gears rattled, clanked, and probably soaked up a lot of power, and they probably didn't last all that long. But our friend Paul Moody came up with a fix. Uh, he first used it in the Appleton Mills in 1828, and basically all he had was a speed increasing gear on the water wheel, and then he had a, uh, he drove, that, that drove one shaft, which had a big drum on it, and that drove that drum drove leather belts that drove power up the mill. Here is a picture that actually we've got in our lobby. It's on the uh, far wall there. And here are two big breast wheels. The wheel has a governor that operates slow skates. And here is a small gear and a big gear on the wheel you can just barely see. And this wheel here turns, has a couple of belts on it that turn this intermediate shaft, and this sends power down the length of the mill and actually drives equipment on two floors. And there's a, another belt off the center of that drum that drives the shaft up here, and a couple more shafts 
So he's doing the whole thing with belts. And the wooden pulleys are fairly easy to make. Later on, they had cast iron spiders in the middle. And you can assemble this out of segments of wood and then put the whole thing on a shaft, turn the shaft with whatever is convenient, probably a water wheel, and you can sit there for a couple days with your wood turning chisel and smooth the periphery of the pulley out, and you've got a working pulley, and one that will work smoothly. Here is a uh, copy from Mr. Malone's book, same thing. There's two breast wheels, two gears here, one drum pulley here, and the, this one drum pulley here that runs your line shafts, and then another that runs up there. It was simple. It worked. It was less expensive, less clumsy than the arrangement that uh, the English were using. And basically, once that was in operation, people stopped even thinking about bevel gears. And here's, of course, part of the museum's line shaft shop. Uh, and if you look, here is a pulley that actually has a wood face to it. And we'll talk about that again in just a minute. Here is a pulley that you may have seen as you came in uh, in the lobby. It's got a spider out of cast iron in the middle and then a wood pulley. And here is the detail showing it's made out of a bunch of segments of wood. And you say, why make something out of wood and later on when you've got the capacity to cast something out of iron completely? Well, the answer was wood pulleys had 50% more friction against a belt than a cast iron pulley. And this made them work especially well <clears throat> in a situation where you had a big pulley driving a smaller pulley uh, and you didn't have much angle of wrap around that smaller pulley, you put a wood pulley on there and the drive will work. If you've got a cast iron pulley, it might slip. Now, I don't know what that big pulley there was worked, used for. Perhaps it drove a generator from a pulley connected uh, around the flywheel of the big engine. But we really don't know. And then the other question is, how do you stop and start these machines? You may have you know, 500 machines in a shop, and if you've got looms, you've got to stop the looms to change the warp thread, or if uh, a thread breaks, you've got to stop it, and you've got to start it. Uh, so you've got an awkward situation. Well, the simple way is what they call a tight and loose pulley arrangement. You have one pulley, that was fastened to the shaft of the machine and then another pulley that ran loose on that shaft. It usually had a bearing in it and then a belt shifter that sw shifted the belt between the two. And up top, the pulley that drove the two had to be wide enough to, for the belt to be shifted. But here's a drill press. Yeah, that's the, right over there is our drill press and that's the, that's the very pulley. And this is a belt shifter here. And this rod goes to the other side of the drill press. And there's a little handle. And you just pull on the handle. It pushes this belt shifter over. And if this is idling, pulls it over here, and drives the drill press. It's simple, it was universally used, and it worked. Now you can see in a larger scale, uh, this is actually a I guess this is a Smithsonian Institution picture quoted in one of my references. And they've got two lines of shafts, lots of belts. And then these shafts also drove equipment on the upper floor. So this is belt drives writ large. From a steam engine, getting the power off the steam engine was easy. You just wrapped your, belt, or your big belt around the flywheel of the engine and most steam engine flywheels were finished as belts. Now the British liked their rope drives and so the Brits, the flywheel on the British engines were grooved for ropes. And here's an example of a rope drive. This is 
the Hull Oaks Lumber Company in Oregon. And here's their steam engine, their flywheel, and they've got a big belt on the flywheel that drives their machinery. It's simple, again, universally used. Now, this is what I gave you before was the situation around 1840. Things started changing around 1845. First of all, people recognized that there were problems with the slide valve engine. It emitted steam throughout the entire valve stroke. It didn't cut off the steam sharply. What you wanted for efficiency was for the valve as a to open for a while and then stop. Stop the steam and then let the steam expand for the rest of the stroke. But with a slide valve engine, there's always some expansion, always some admission of steam, and it, uh, it didn't stop. The other thing was that the governor action wasn't too good. The governor throttled the steam instead of shortening the period of admission. And finally, because the amount of steam in the steam chest and the governor chamber, it took a while for the engine to respond to changes in the governor. Now here is our governor, and I mentioned bevel gears. Well, these apparently were machine cut. Uh, and so these are actually pretty, pretty accurate. And as the speed increases, these balls fly apart, and as they do, they pull a rod here down, and that rod goes all the way down here and closes the steam valve. Well, that's simple. That restricts the flow of steam to the engine. So if the speed increases, it slows the engine down. But it does it by reducing the pressure of steam that the engine is pushing on the engine piston. So it reduces the amount of steam that can expand and reduces the efficiency. The innovation that made all of the difference in efficiency was what was called the drop cutoff valve gear. The drop cutoff valve gear was an arrangement of cams uh, <clears throat> and other pieces of equipment that tripped the valves to shut off quickly at a point where the, uh, where the governor had determined that there was enough steam being admitted to the cylinder. So it was linking the governor linkage with the valves. Um, and it was a somewhat complicated mechanism. Um, the drop cutoff provided that sharp cutoff so that the steam would go into the cylinder and then it would start to expand. The pressure in the cylinder would decrease, but it would be expanding and making use of the energy in the steam. And if the load on the engine decreased, and the governor and the engine started to speed up, the governor would sense this and it would shut off the steam sooner in the stroke. It didn't throttle it, it just shut it off quicker, which meant less steam went into the engine and the part load efficiency stayed up. And also, because this, the governor could shut off the steam right in the middle of a uh, stroke where steam was being admitted, the speed control was better. And this just revolutionized building of mill engines. They were still, you know, simple engines being built. But if you had a large, important engine, it was going to use a drop cutoff valve gear. And again, less steam consumption, better part load operation, better regulation. What happened with the mill engine builders? Well, we talked about Fairbanks, Clark and Company. After a few changes in the partnership, it became Nightingale and Corliss, and then Corliss Engine Company, um, owned, George Corliss owner, who owned the Corliss engine patents, including the drop cutoff valve gear. Thurston Green and Company used the Sickles cutoff, which was similar, and they were in litigation with Corliss for a number of years. And depending upon who you read, they had more or less trouble, but it appears they designed their way around the Corliss patents. After the Corliss patents expired in 1870, many other builders jumped into the market building very similar steam engines. 
And because there were so many people building these engines in Providence, and because the market was right there in Providence Road, near Providence, all the mills in New England, southern New England, down into Connecticut, needing steam engines, Providence became a center of mill engine building. Here's a, cla here's a classic view of the Corliss engine. And steam comes in here, and here are the two inlet valves, and here are the two exhaust valves, the main crankshaft, and here is a rod from an eccentric that goes back and forth that operates the valve gear. And here's the governor, and the governor pushes on an arm here that makes the valve gear open either earlier or later. And here's an actual cordless valve gear in the flesh. This is at the Rhode Island Museum of Steam and Wireless. <coughs> and they, they ran this uh, just this last fall. And here again, there are two rods. Here's one from one here. And there's another one here from Governor Linkage that control where the, when the valves take steam. And if it needs more steam, then these, these rods will move and let more steam in. This is the valve linkage here, which is a fairly complex contraption. And the valves are in here. They're half cylinders and they change position, either open or close. The valve ports, and here are the exhaust valves, similar type. And this red can <coughs> here is called a dash pot, and its purpose is to cushion the closing of the valve so that when this is released, it doesn't slam down uh, and damage things because this is going to be happening 75 times a minute. And here is the crank end of the Corliss engine, the big flywheel, and a belt to drive the governor. And it's my understanding that many of these governor designs had fail-safe provisions. So if you lost the belt on the governor, it would shut, shut off steam. Green designed a somewhat different engine, and they had a couple of cams here that opened and closed the valves. And here, here is the linkage from the governor, and here is the rod that moves the valves, and here is a rod that operates the exhaust valves. Uh, and here is the crank end of the green engine. Uh, and again, at the Rhode Island Museum. And this made a big difference. This cut the cordless engine. Turns out the mill owners figured out another way to do it. After they had their cordless engines in there, a textile mill takes a lot of, a lot of steam for process use. Uh, if you're weaving cloth, you put starch into the threads, the warp threads, before you weave it to stiffen them so they don't break. If you're going to be dyeing or printing or bleaching cloth after you're done with whatever operation it is, you got to dry the cloth. And all of this is done with steam heated uh, cylinders and the cloth goes over it, and the steam inside keeps the cloth hot and evaporates the water. Well, the owners realized that they could get this steam from the exhaust of their engines. While you can run an engine, steam engine condensing, if you decrease the pressure below atmospheric, you don't have enough volume in the cylinder to fully expand that steam, and because of that, you get some benefit, but you don't get as much benefit uh, as you could if you could use all of that energy in that steam. So instead, they said, hey, we'll use it for our process. We'll just you know, connect all these 
engines, run them non-condensing, and use that for heating. And uh, by 1886, the Merrimack Manufacturing Company, they had over 100 steam cylinders exhausting steam into a common main that provided all of their heat. And that was process heat, and then in the wintertime, heat for the building. And given the sprawling nature of their buildings, that was probably quite a bit of heat. This mill here, from an 1887 fire insurance map, we had six coilless boilers totaling 1,600 horsepower, one 1,000 horsepower engine. They didn't say whose, but presumably if the boilers came from coilless, the engine probably came from coilless. And they show, the fire map shows uh, the canals, but it doesn't say anything about a turbine. Uh, and the museum stores material in a basement area way back in there, I don't know, a couple hundred feet back. And in that unfinished area, you can still see a few supports for what, a bit, what would have been line shafting. Well, what happened in the water business, the hydro business? Well, first of all, people were plagued by the fact that the water wasn't reliable. So what do we do to make the water more reliable? In 1846, the Essex Company, who was basically ran the water power operation in Lawrence, led the mill owners in Lawrence as well as in Lowell to purchase the mill that had the water rights to Lake Winnipesaukee. Biggest lake in New Hampshire, the headwaters of the Merrimack River, and they owned the right to the water out of that lake. So now they could control it, and later on they added Squam Lake and Newfound Lake. So they had control of the water, and now they could control the river. And they did. Now within limits, because again, if they dropped the river, the lake too much, they'd get lawsuits from people who were affected. Uh, they were boating interests on the lake even then, and you couldn't drop the, the lake level too much and have all the boats grounded, but they, they could drop it something like six feet in the summer and 12 feet in the winter, and this helped stabilize the stream flow, and it saved them enough money to pay for that big northern canal in Lowell. Also in Lowell, James Francis, the chief engineer, pioneered in measuring the water. So they used float surveys and they were able to show exactly how much water each mill used. And they enabled, were able to basically find out who was using more than they'd purchased and if they were using too much, tell them or force ways of getting them to use less so there's more for other people. And this was a fairly substantial piece of pioneering work. And in addition, all over, the mill owners were getting more sophisticated about making use of storage in mill ponds. And eventually, everybody had to have uniform working hours so that at the end of the day, the gates would be shut and the river could refill the mill pond. And on Sunday, you couldn't work. And as a result, the mill owners were just as regimented in their operation as the employees were because they couldn't work overtime even if they had a big order coming in. Uh, they'd have to run their steam engines to run the looms to uh, meet the order. Then we got to water turbines. In 1832, a man named Fauneron, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, <coughs> developed a radial outflow turbine. And a man named Uriah Boyden, uh, first name right out of Dickens, uh, read of this work. And in 1844, he designed a 75 horsepower Fauneron type turbine that ran for the uh, picking house at the Appleton Mills that ran at 78% efficiency. Well, their breast wheels had been running 60% efficiency, 
So 78% was a big jump. If you go from 60 to 75%, that's 20% more. So this is a bit more. This was a big thing because if the water wheel can produce the same amount of power with less water, it runs more efficiently, then you can run more equipment with the same amount of water. I mean, they had a certain amount of water at their disposal. So now they could run more. And this was, so the mill owners gradually switched over to turbines. And Boyden went on to build other turbines. And here is how uh, this worked. And again, this looks like an older illustration. And this is again from uh, Malone's book. And the water would come in and then go out there. And there were guides that gave it a turning motion. There was a gate right here. And the gate opened and closed to regulate the flow. And then the runner was here and basically would run, operate this way and would remove some of that turning motion and in so doing would develop power to turn the shaft. And it worked. Now you could show theoretically that you're probably better off with inward flow than outward flow and I'll get to that in a minute. But here's a picture of a Boyden turbine. This is from the French River Land Company webpage. And the thing is, here's that runner, and here is the gate and the Armstrong speed control apparatus. Well, the people from the French River Land Company were doing a renovation job on some other hydro. They were poking around the back of some old plant inside something, and they saw this. And here is the runner of an old Boyden turbine. Now it looks like the before part of an Evapo Rostad, and machinists know what that is, but it's a compound that really does remove rust, but, and it probably doesn't work, but here it is, it's still in existence. Now while Boyden was working on the Forneron design, uh, Francis, who worked with him, was actually the chief engineer of the locks and canals in Lowell, was working on another design. Locks and canals had purchased the rights, at least locally, to the Howd turbine, which the water flowed inward. And uh, he started, Francis started working on this, and because of his work with this turbine, uh, the name Francis was, became associated with the inward flow turbine. Now I said earlier that the theory shows that you can actually make this uh, work a little bit better than outward flow, but you've got a problem. That water is coming this way, and it's all crashing into each other, and it's got to turn that way. Uh, Francis' innovation was to, and this is from the Lowell Hydraulic, experiments, which was an 1860s volume. Um, here, is, here are the guides out here that guide the water, again, and give it a tangential motion. And then the runner has buckets here, and then the rest of it is shaped to turn the water down and in. And I think that the way they're showing it here is more hope than actual, but it does something like that. Now here's something else. Here's the water in the head race. And I guess it's got enough pressure that it's actually up to here. But here's the tail race. It's up above the turbine. This machine is running in backwater, heavy duty backwater. And it's working. Suddenly, with both the Boyden and the Francis type turbines, the people had a machine that operated better efficiency than the breast wheels and would operate in backwater. They had basically found the holy grail. And people went on to design turbines, mostly by cut and try, uh, 
the Europeans used some engineering theory, such as they had back in those days, to work on turbine design. Americans had some testing flumes at their disposal, first in uh, Lowell and then the big one on the Connecticut River in Holyoke. And they would cut and try and adapt. <clears throat> one of the goals of a, a turbine designer was to make the turbine go faster so it was easier to drive a shaft with. And they did this by making the wheel smaller. Well, to make the wheel smaller, they had to make it wider. You see these buckets now are quite wide. Well, now your problem with turning the water from radial to down gets to be much worse. And so these buckets now go, have quite a bit of twist to them. Um, but they began to work. I'm only showing this for the drive. They've got a vertical turbine here, shaft comes up, got a pulley, vertical shaft, and with a quarter turn drive, they were able to turn a horizontal shaft. And the millwrights of the day were able to make that work and make the belt drives do a quarter of a turn. And in some cases, without any guide pulleys. Here's a modern rotor being repaired. And I got this from the, uh, again, the French River Land Company's website. And you can see this is where the water comes in, more or less radially with some twisting motion. And then it comes out here. And these buckets here are designed to let the water go straight out this way. And that's a rotor maybe uh, 10, 20 years old. So this is the progress they made in turbine design. After 1885, there were a few more changes. Uh, political pressure finally got to the folks in Massachusetts and they gave up on their holdings in New ha lakes in New Hampshire. Now part of this was also that there were more and more steam engines running mills in Lowell and Lawrence and up the river. So they really didn't gain as much from uh, those holdings. Um, somebody developed the Lombard water turbine governor. It was a man named Lombard. And before anybody asks, I don't know if that Lombard was the same Lombard that designed the Lombard steam long hauler. Uh, the record is not very clear there, but there was a Lombard steam long hauler used in the North Woods, and there is a Lombard governor. And as a matter of fact, the museum has one right there at the back of the room. And the reason it was necessary was because, as you can see from these pictures, these water turbines had a lot of gates along the side, and it took a fair amount of force to close those gates to regulate the speed. And you couldn't do it with a regular centrifugal governor. And here's the museum's governor. And this big cylinder is a hydraulic cylinder. It's got oil under pressure in it. And depending upon where it's positioned, it pushes this rack which turns this gear, which turns the output shaft. And this big wheel here is just for hand operation if you want to operate the turbine under hand control to set something up. And here again is the governor shaft, and I think I found a fail safe on this one. And here are, here's the flyball governor. This is a fairly complicated valve mechanism in here that proportions oil to either side of the cylinder. And then there's a couple of linkages here that actually feed back the position of that uh, center rack to make sure it's uh, doing exactly what the control says. Steam power, well, the engines were scaled up to as large as 2,500 horsepower or larger. Uh, there's the trencher field mill engine in England, 2,500 horsepower that ran a spinning mill. Um, 
steam turbine was developed by Parsons in England in 1884, and the AC motor got on the market roughly 1885. I'll go through some of these in reverse order. The AC motor freed people from the line shaft. Now, you can do it with a DC motor, but a DC motor, for various technical reasons, requires an elaborate starter. And also, it's got a commutator that, if it's adjusted poorly, will spark. I have seen DC motors from the 20s still running without sparking. Not a 20 horsepower motor, but whoever set the motor up had to know what they were doing. And a cotton mill sparking commutator probably be frowned upon by the mill's uh, insurance company. Uh, so, but the AC motor, you could start with a, a simple switch if you wanted to, and that's how we start these two motors that drive our line shaft. Uh, and so suddenly you didn't have to uh, have a big line shaft if you expanded your mill. Although the Witten Machine Company's catalog for textile machinery in 1917 had the base listing with a line shaft. And if you wanted a uh, belt, a uh, motor, they'd sell you a kit to put a motor on it. Um, the turbine, the steam turbine, basically made large scale electrification possible. It's a high, inherently a high speed machine, which means it's running with much lower mass than a big steam engine. It costs much less to build. Uh, and it's much more efficient, as we will see. Um, and then the scaling up, this mill had a 2,500 horsepower engine. But here's a picture of the Trencher Field engine in England. It's been preserved. There's a very nice YouTube video on YouTube. Trencher Field mill engine. Um, it originally powered a spinning mill, but I understand that's gone. But there's one rope on this rope drive flywheel that goes off somewhere. Um, and it's a very nice, pretty, well-made engine, probably better made than some of our American engines. But by 1920s, available in sizes up to 40,000 kilowatt hours, and utility would put two or three of these machines in a central station, and suddenly they've got a central station rated over 100,000 kilowatts, which was a big central station. The steam rates were around nine pounds per horsepower hour or less. This compares with maybe 25 pounds per horsepower hour uh, for an engine. So if you haven't got a use for the exhaust steam, suddenly you're cutting the steam consumption way down. It's a lightweight machine for its power, and so it's going to cost less than building a massive uh, mill engine. And <clears throat> Parsons licensed the design to Westinghouse and later Alice Chalmers. General Electric took a somewhat different approach and licensed a steam turbine design, mainly from a man named Curtis. Um, there's an interesting story about Mr. Parsons. He was selling, trying to sell marine engines and decided he needed to demonstrate what his steam turbine could do. And so he built a demonstration vessel, about 100 feet long, I think about nine foot beam. It's still preserved. It's called the Turbinia. And I think he put three 1,000 horsepower turbines in this thing. And he had a miserable time getting the propellers to work at high speed. And later on, people found that you've got to gear those propellers, those turbines down to drive the, uh, tur the propellers and design and construction of that gearing as a story unto itself. But Parsons figured out how to get the propellers to work. He got 34 and a half knots out of this boat, and I think in about 1893. Where is he going to show this off? About this time, 
they were having the Diamond Jubilee for Queen Victoria and a great big naval parade. Now at this point, some of the accounts differ. Some of this has become legend and the nearest I can determine and that's really true is Parsons had semi-official permission to enter this naval celebration. Somebody said, no, nah, it's, it's okay, or it's, we won't object, or something like that. But anyhow, he's suddenly zipping through this whole bunch of either parked or moving ships. And then the British find they haven't got anything that'll stop him. No, stop that boat. They haven't got anything. And then it dawns on the Admiralty that this is important. And it's very important if their naval competitors, like the Germans, get this and they don't get it. Well, Parsons sold some turbines. Uh, so it's, and that's the British, after some problems, finally preserved and restored this boat. And it's in a museum somewhere in England. Um, but the turbine made the central utility industry possible. And this mill in 1922, from the fire insurance map, they had a 2,500 horsepower engine installed and the foundations were there and over there, there's that black corridor leading up to the bathrooms, runs right between the two foundations. They had a steam turbine, 300 horsepower installed and that is the big block right behind the main desk. And I'm conjecturing that that turbine may have been running on the exhaust steam from the steam engine, and they may have been running the steam engine to provide electricity while generating process steam for the dye plant that they had here. They still had the water turbine with 350 horsepower. I originally figured it was 350 kW, but even 350 horsepower was more than the Charles River flow could readily support. And they purchased 800 horsepower. And they distributed it at 550 volts. And there's an interesting story here because most power distribution systems in buildings back in those days ran at multiples of 110. 110 volts for lighting and 220 for small motors. 440 for heavy duty motors. Textile industry very early on settled on 550 volts. Um, I worked in a textile mill under construction in South Carolina, summer of 1963, and it was all 550 volts. And I've heard elsewhere on the internet that the that rest of the industry is still 550. And 550 volts is spread to parts of New England a big plastics plant I worked in in Springfield in 1966 it was all 550 volt. I know, because for some of my projects I had to purchase 550 volt motors, and so we understand the difference between 440 and 550. Um, and it's just an interesting textile industry artifact. Now if I were the plant engineer running this utility system, I'd probably, well, first of all, I'd get all I could out of the hydro turbine. They, we own it, it's paid for, and just run it because the power there is free. Um, and that might have had a Lombard water turbine governor on it to maintain the load. Um, I'd run the mill engine to meet my process steam loads from the, um, the dye plant and make uh, power while doing that, and then run the 300 horsepower turbine to balance the steam from the engine with the demands on process. And what I didn't need, what I didn't have, I'd buy from the power company, assuming that their rates allowed me to buy power at, uh, you know, the amount that varied over the day, some rates uh, penalize you if your load varies too much, but if their, look, their rate allowed me to, that's what I would do. Now, these boilers, this, this boiler room was built in 1911. 
still researching why they built this boiler room in 1911 when they built the engine rooms in 1901, 1902, 1903. There's still, the jury is still out on a lot of things like that. So there's a lot we don't know. Um, and that's about all I've got on my presentation, and so I'll take questions.